Today we're going to be talking about alcoholism. It is America's worst drug problem. I actually took a course in WSU in this a while back and this is what the professor said. What is the difference between the effects of alcohol and say the effects of cocaine or heroin and these other heavy drugs? What's the difference? There's no major difference, it's just one is legal and the other is not legal. That's the main thing that you're really dealing with here. Here are some statistics. 50.9% of people in America drink. That's about 125 million people that are drinking. 23% binge drink. 6.6% .6 are heavy drinkers. Around 10% are dependent. That means they're addicted. 6.3% are addicted to alcohol. Another 1.3% are addicted to both. That's a total of 7.6, but of course we're not talking about the other drugs in this particular class. The third leading cause of death in America, 50% of the highway deaths, a major factor in suicide. 81% of Catholics drink. 64% of Protestants drink at least socially. So how does it work? How does alcohol affect you? It's absorbed directly without digestion from the stomach and the intestines and the fastest from an empty stomach. It acts like an anesthesia by depressing the central nervous system. As I told you before, it was used in the 1800s as an anesthesia, except its difference between when it was effective and when it killed you was so narrow, they killed so many people that as soon as they got something else, they switched to something else. It lowers the blood flow to your brain. It affects are dependent on the rate of the rise in the blood alcohol level. So it means if you drink faster and a lot, you actually have a much greater effect and it, and it does you more damage. It has tolerance. Impaired motor functioning depends on how often you drink. It's at 0 0.05 for an abstainer, someone who doesn't drink normally, 0 0.07 for a moderate drinker, and 0.1 for a heavy drinker. Your effects are on the body are different by how much you weigh and it's even different between men and women. A blood alcohol level of 0.35 will cause death. And of course we hear about those fairly often, don't we, especially in fraternities. In parties like that, someone just drank enough that they died from it. Now the physical consequences. And I'm going to do my best to give you the best pronunciation I can of all of these terms, but I'll explain what they are, just so you sort of know what they are, because a lot of these are very complicated, long names of all these things that can affect you from the problem of alcohol. Some of those you're, you're going to know, some of these you probably never heard about, but they do have this effect on the person. The first is, is cirrhosis. Scarred liver due to fat deposits. The seventh cause of death, believe it or not, is cirrhosis of the liver. So how much effect is alcohol having on people? Hepatic encephalopathy, brain poisoning due to liver problems. Because your liver isn't processing and getting all the... Uh, the toxins and so on out of your body, it affects your brain and poisons your brain. Hypoglycemia can be caused by drinking, low blood sugar, hypertension, high blood pressure, alcoholic ketocidosis. This is too much acid in your cells. esophagitis, inflammation of the esophagus. And if it gets too bad, it can burst and kill you. 
peptic ulcer. Lacerations in the stomach can be caused by alcohol. Pancreatitis, inflammation of the pancreas, leading to jaundice. Peripheral nerve pressure palsies, uncontrolled tremors. Central potine myelinitis, that's nerve sheath damage. That can cause that your uh, nerve sheaths in your body can be destroyed uh, through the alcohol. Myopathy, muscle disease due to a low oxygen or sugar because it cuts down the amount of oxygen. Cardiomyopathy, heart disease due to the fat deposits. Mycoreflavia, bignamia disease, degeneration of the life left brain connectors. You know, there's a long list here, but we need to know all the damage that is possible most people don't realize. Alcohol dementia, hallucinations due to degeneration of brain functioning. Increased risk of cancer in the mouth, pharynx, and larynx. Wernicke Karakosov syndrome, that's brain damage. Of course, pregnancy fetal alcohol syndrome. Delirium tremors, that's one we know a lot more about. When the person has tremors, hallucinations, delusions, and seizures. Cerebral atrophy. Increased space in the brain. They actually take a look at the brain and you find out that there are actually air holes in between the brain caused by the alcohol. And what they've actually found out here is that teenagers who start drinking, these problems are even greater. But now we have, you thought we were done, but now we have a whole nother set of problems that are caused by alcohol due to malnutrition. Because the alcohol goes directly through your system and so you don't feel like you're hungry, so you don't eat the right things. Impairs absorption of the food you eat. So even if you're eating the food, it doesn't go through your system and you don't get the nutrients. Replaces food without nutrients, has lots of calories, and stops appetites. That's why this happens. Increases metabolism. Reduces effectiveness of the enzymes that break down the food. So again, even if you're eating, your body isn't dealing with the food and you're not getting the nutrients from the food. That's why we have the malnutrition. Liver is occupied rather than breaking down food like it's supposed to. Deposits of fat in the liver, belly, or heart. See, lots of people, you, you see that belly that people have? Well, it's also in their liver, also in their heart. And here are some of the diseases now from those deficiencies. Wernicke syndrome, brain deterioration caused in dementia, lethargy, and gait. I mean, the person doesn't, the person walks sort of in spurts. Ataxia, a thiamine deficiency. Kardakoff syndrome, dementia, amnesia, that's also thiamine. Cerebral degeneration. Gait ataxia. Again, that weird moving. Increased spaces in the brain. Polyneuropathy. Brain disease. Ambulophia. Optic nerve atrophy. Loss of vision. You can even go blind. Perligra. Skin itch, vomiting, diarrhea, delir delirium. It's a lack of nicotinic acid. Aren't those really interesting that the person, all those things that a person is taking on when they're drinking and drinking too much? What else do you get? Hangover. This is from withdrawal. Vomiting. Delirial tremors. Now here's something else that maybe you're not too aware of. This is what's called post-acute withdrawal. Post-acute withdrawal says what you have really done 
is you've significantly damaged your brain. And so it's going to take between six months and 18 months for your brain to recover if you're dealing with this alcoholism and so on. Now other drugs can do this also, but primarily in alcohol. And this is what it interferes with. In high stress situations, you're not going to be able to function normally. The syndromes during healing, difficulty thinking clearly, difficulty managing dif uh, feelings and emotions, difficulty remembering things, difficulty sleeping restfully, maintaining physical condition, and managing stress. So you're setting yourself up for that kind of a life for at least six months to 18 months. And of course, what happens with that? That's why people tend to relapse, and that's why we say that a person really can't recover fully from an alcohol addiction if it doesn't take six months to 18 months, because that's what it takes for your body to get back to normal from the effects of the alcohol. Theories of alcohol addiction. They're a lot like the ones we just went over last time. The first one's what they call an addictive personality, that passive dependent, codependent type of personality. They mention another one here, a sociopathic personality, meaning that they really don't care about other people. Social learning theory, it's response to problematic situations. Reduction of anxiety, stress reliever, of course, what did we call that? Medicating emotions, didn't we? And of course, then you have, uh, they talk about recovery of cognitive dissonance as a reinforcer. What they're saying is, if you want to do something wrong, you drink first. <laughs> because you don't have the same moral level and you don't feel as bad about what you're doing. So in alcohol, that sometimes has an effect. And, of course, there's still a certain amount of genetic disposition, other things like that. But we talked about those primarily last time. What are the components of this problem? Choice, the current stress that you have in your life, your personality, feelings of inferiority, and basically the genetic things. Okay, so that's the overall picture. Now let's see what the Bible says about drinking. Because there's a usual controversy that goes on here. I'm going to let you sort it out for yourself. What's the controversy? Well, should Christians drink? Is it okay? Did Jesus drink? Did the people in the Bible drink? And we're going to give you the information and let you sort that one out for yourself. In the Jewish culture, Drinking was a part of the Jewish culture. But you have to understand something, okay? It isn't as clear-cut as we would like it to be. Because when it's talking about wine in the Bible, it could be talking about grape syrup. It could be talking about boiled grape juice. And it can be talking about fermented wine. Because in those days, they had all three of those, and because they come from the grapevine, they're all considered wine. Of course, the last one is the only one that's alcoholic. Drunkenness in the Old Testament is seen as a great sin. In their society, drinking was pretty much the norm, but it could have been any one of those three. You see what I'm saying? But getting drunk was a great sin. Let me give you some Bible verses here. Deuteronomy 21, 20. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious, and he will not obey our voice, and he is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones, that he die. So shall you put evil away from you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. What would happen today if we stoned everybody that had this problem? It'd solve it, wouldn't it? Galatians 5.19 Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. 
adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, reviling, and such like of which I have told you before, as I have told you in the past, in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, they're an addiction. Either you're going to overcome the addiction or the addiction is going to overcome your faith. That's the battle. 1 Corinthians 6.10 Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall enter the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 5.11 but now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or drunkard or an extortioner, with such a one do not eat. Proverbs 21, verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You see, verses after verses after verses about this particular subject. Got a lot more to go. I just want you to listen. I'm not trying to get you all this down, but I want you to get the overall flavor of what the Bible is saying about all of this stuff. Proverbs 31, 4. It is not for kings, O Lamel, it is not for kings to drink wine nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert judgment of any of the afflicted. Now this is Isaiah 28, 7. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They ear in vision, they stumble in judgment. And Isaiah 5.11, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may drink strong drink to continue until night, till wine inflame them. Woe unto them that are mighty in strong drink, in men of strength to mingle strong drink. Abstinence was seen as part of sanctification, especially with the Nazarites. Do you remember Samson? He was supposed to be a Nazarite. Was he supposed to be drinking? No. So it's seen as part of sanctification. Let's look at some examples of drunkenness. This is from Solomon. Ecclesiastes 2.31 I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my heart with wisdom and to lay hold of folly that I might see what was that good for the sons of men which they should do under heaven all the days of their life. Then Proverbs 23, 29. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it is given its color to the cup, when it is moving itself aright. At last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. How about Noah? Did Noah have a problem? Remember when right after the flood, he got drunk? The Bible tells us in Genesis 9.21. And he drank of the wine, and it was drunken, and he was uncovered in the tent. How about Lot? How did Lot's daughters get him to commit incest with them? By getting him drunk. 
See, do you see the idea? We're playing with something that not only destroys you physically, but opens you up to all sorts of sin and to all sorts of other problems. How about Nabal? 1 Samuel 25, 36. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. And it came to pass in the morning, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, that his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. And it came to pass about ten days after that the Lord smote Nabal, and he dies. Most people believe he died of an alcoholic seizure. What's God's alternative? Ephesians 5.18 Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now the question is, did Jesus drink? Well, we know he made wine at the wedding, didn't we? Because we're not sure what kind of wine he made, depending on what the words were. Matthew 11.18 for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath the devil. And the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. So at least they called him that, but we don't have anything to say for sure one way or another of whether he drank or whether he did not drink. So the question is this. First question is, should a Christian drink? Second question is, should a counselor drink? So let's take a look at those and sort through all those verses that I had and see if we can put it together in some more concrete way. Do you need an anesthetic as a crutch? Or is God sufficient for you? If alcohol was not legal, would you take it? Because I said it's very clear that the effects are very significant. In fact, the interesting thing is the effects of alcohol on your body may be more detrimental than the effects of the rest of the drugs on your body and how they affect you. Would you take cocaine if it was legal? What would you take if it was legal? Well, it's the same thing. The only question is, our society, because prohibition failed, <laughs> makes this one legal and all the rest of them illegal. But you and your conscience, you have to decide what you're willing to do. And of course, what you decide is going to be an example to your clients, isn't it? Here's an interesting question. Are you a king or a priest? What does the Bible tell us? We are, and what did the verse say? It is not for kings, Olamel, to drink strong drink. But this is not an easy question. You're going to have to sort this out. Because what did I say? How many Catholics drink? How many Protestants drink? People have come up with different conclusions. I know I've been in churches before that they say no one should drink. But here's sort of the bottom line, okay? Romans 14, 21. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. For he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Why is it an important problem? Because whatever you decide, make sure that's what you really believe and that's what you're really doing because you will be held accountable for what you do. See, if you believe it's all wrong and you do it, it is what? Sin. If you don't, you're going to be held accountable for what? Does it make your brother stumble? So think of it sort of this way. In Jewish society, 
in the days that the Bible was written, did they have cars? No, so probably we didn't have a lot of car wrecks, did we? And basically everybody drank to a certain degree, and the only thing that was really condemned in those days was drunkenness, and that was considered to be a sin. But how about our society today? How much effect does our society today have on this? Well, if 50% of our car wrecks are all caused by people drinking, and this is the amount of damage that we're seeing if you overdrink all that list that I just gave you of all those things, how it is destroying a person, do you know anybody has ever stumbled over alcohol? Probably everybody does. And how many clients are you going to get that they're struggling with this? A huge amount. And if, let's just say, you're a drug alcohol counselor, say, well, I understand they have that problem, that's okay, but it's okay for me to go to the bars and drink, right? And whenever your client comes into the bar, and there you are sitting, half smashed. Do you think there's any possibility they might say, you know what, I can drink? We're dealing with alcohol. What is the statistic that says a person that after they've been an alcoholic for a significant period of time can ever get back to the place where they can manage alcohol effectively? It's actually 10%. But it's extremely low. And so if these people are encouraged to drink, what is going to happen? Let me tell you a story of a man that took a drink. He was a client of mine. He'd been free from drinking for something like eight years. And he went to this hotel with his family and they had free beer at the pool. Think he'd be tempted a little bit? So he took one drink. And then another drink and another drink and he ended up at the bar. He doesn't remember what happened to him after that. Because they found him about 20 miles away from the hotel. He had rolled his car eight times the only air pocket in the car he was in, he had a broken arm. It was a miracle that he had survived. It started with one drink because the drink eventually takes a drink and eventually you open yourself up and it knocks down your inhibitions and so more and more and more is the amount of damage that is done. How many of you here have ever known anyone that was an alcoholic, and they died from it. Yeah, several hands. Remember one time in our drug alcohol program, within the space of like a month, two of the people came in and said, my friend just died of alcohol poisoning, he died of cirrhosis of the liver. I had one time, in one year, I had two people come in and say, my mom killed my dad. What do you mean your mom killed your dad? Well, he was drinking and she would never set boundaries and she enabled him and he died of cirrhosis of the liver. This is a real problem and you're going to have to decide what you're willing to do. But would it make somebody else stumble if they see you drinking as a Christian? How many non-Christians, what do they think about us Christians? Should we be drinking? Now, nah, they're saying, you're a Christian and you drink? Come on now. So let's sort of put this whole thing together. Do you see the big picture? Alcohol is like all the rest of the drugs, except it is legal. You can buy it any place you want to. You can have as much as you want. You can get drunk. What do you think the possibility is that it's going to destroy you or cause you major health problems, or really mess up your life. Extremely high. Especially if you've been a counselor for a while, you know how many people come in are struggling with all these things. Once you get to that place, is it easy to get out of this? Remember that addictive cycle? Short-term gain, long-term loss, 
What's it going to do as a minimum to you? Make you feel worse about yourself and increase the struggles that you have in your life. And you're going to have to decide. You know, that's what the Bible says. If I'm a king and a priest, should I be drinking? If I'm a counselor, should I be drinking? If I'm a Christian, should I be drinking? But then the question is, how are you going to deal with this with your clients? They come in, they're having a drinking problem. Are you going to faint? Roll your eyes? Do you realize how bad that is? Do you realize what you're doing to yourself? Is that going to help them? What does the average pastor say to him? Just try hard to stop. Is that going to really work? Not when they're that's consumed. And if you see the damage that it does and the things that it do, does, see, we as counselors are to have what? The best interest of our clients in mind. God has the best interest of you in mind. The question is, why would you drink? See, the question shouldn't be, why do you not drink? The question should be, why would you drink? Let's see, it's poison. It may have a fairly high probability of destroying my life. There are all these diseases that I can get and everything that's going to mess me up. It cuts off the, my brain. I'm losing brain cells every time I do it. It could mess up my brain so bad it's going to take me 6 to 18 months to recover. And the more I do it, the more I'm going to want to do it. I get into that cycle. I'm going to feel worse and worse and worse about myself as I'm doing it. So I think that'd be fun, right? You'll have to decide because everyone makes our own choices and we get our own consequences. One of the things we ask here, is especially a drug alcohol counselor, is that they don't drink because of the high probability they're going to meet somebody or one of their guys that they're working with or whatever is going to see them out drinking or whatever and it's going to give them just enough to take that one more drink so they can end up in the ditch. Because you as a counselor are an example, aren't you? And you're a Christian example. If you're leading a group and you've got several people in there and they have drinking problems and you tell them about your last time you were out drinking, is that going to help them or is that going to help them stumble? These are all decisions that every one of us has to make, but you as a counselor have a higher responsibility. You as a Christian have a higher responsibility to model what is right and what is good. Now let's go back to that last <clears throat> verse. What did it say? Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to spend my money. I think I'll do it on Christian books and on Christian things and be filled with the Spirit rather than taking those kind of chances of destroying my own life and messing up other people around me because they follow my example. Let's pray. Lord, we know that you're full of grace and you're full of mercy. And we know that you want to deliver every one of us from our addictions. And Lord, we realize the strength that alcohol has on our society and the tremendous amount of damage that it does. And I ask, Lord, you'd help every person, Lord God, here to decide what they're going to do with their lives, to decide how they're going to affect other people's lives and decide what you really want for their life. And Lord, we'll give you all the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen.